The readings today contain one of those words that everyone uh, perks up at hearing. Yes, Antichrist. That uh, gets one's attention. That, uh, the letters of John are the only place in Scripture where that term shows up, Antichrist. And contrary to how it is commonly portrayed in movies and culture today, Antichrist is not that one evil, horrible person who's going to destroy the world. Um, Antichrist is actually exactly what it sounds like. It is anyone who is anti Christ. It is anyone who uh, is not proclaiming Christ accurately. If we remember from uh, last week, we were chatting about uh, the first letter of John. The challenge in the first letter of John is that the church has split. This is, uh, as far as we know, it could be the first church split that ever occurs. And the split has occurred because uh, there are those who are teaching, the, focusing so much on Jesus as showing us who God is, that they're losing the whole and in the flesh. They're, they're focusing on God and forgetting the whole humanity part. They're, they're just not, they're downplaying that so much as, as it fades away. And, and so according to the letters of John, those that deny that Jesus came in the flesh are antichrists, each and every one of them. So there's a whole bunch of them. And uh, notice that John doesn't say anything about anti-God. This, this is an argument about how God is known and focusing on, on Jesus. The, the logic of it being, it, as G, John says many times, God is love, connecting the two. If you want to know God, you need to love. And God, that, that's the logic of it. But the, what, the next step of that is that the nature of that love, the shape of that love, the practices that, that make up that love are known in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. If you want to know what, who God is, you have to know love. Well, how do I know what love is? Well, look at Jesus. That, that's the, the logic of this. And, and it makes sense that we would have to have something concrete to grab onto. Love in the abstract is just warms and fuzzies, but like, what is love? It, on, on Mother's Day, it, it seems fitting to, to ask, like, does your, did your mother or does your mother love you in the abstract? Right? Or are there concrete practices that, that sort of make up how your mama loves you? Like, there's that thing that she makes that no one else makes. That only she can make it, right? Like, the, the cream de mint brownies. Like, for my family, the cream de mint brownies. My mama made those cream de mint brownies for decades. One time she said, do we, do we need to make those cream de mint brownies for Christmas? And there was almost a family revolt. We must have the brownies, right? That, that is the nature of love in the Kuhn family. It's a layer of brownie, a layer of cream de mint frosting, and a layer of pure chocolate. That's what love tastes like for Kuhn's. Cream de mint brownies, right? We have these stories, we have these things like the smell of your mama's kitchen, that, that certain snark in her voice that only she can pull off. Like my mom would accuse me of now, don't be a martyr, Andy. I, that, I read the word martyr before I ever said the word martyr. And so I kind of, how do you pronounce martyr if you've never heard it said? So my mom has mocked me for that for decades. Like, that, that is the shape of love. That's the sound of love is my mom mocking me. The point being, we all, <laughs> we all have these, these specific relationships of what is love? The love of your, of your mama, it looks like this. It's not warm and fuzzy. There, there's particularity about that. And so when we want to talk about God is love, well, what does the love of God look like? It looks like the particularity, the details, what does Jesus do? That is love. Right? We've got to have put some meat on it to understand what we mean when we say God is love. And the problem is there are those who are say, so focusing on the God is love that they're not getting the, the particularity and the meat and the details of the life uh, of Jesus. And what has happened is the first people who have come into the church as the church is forming, John has laid this out, like God is love. How do you understand love? Love is to look at the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And they've gone, oh, I get that. And they've, it made sense. And, and then this, as more people have shown up and they've, they've, they haven't followed. Like, I'm, I'm, what I say, what you hear, what I meant, and what you think I meant don't always line up. Like, that's the danger of speaking in public. And that's what's happened to John. Like, he has said something, and he meant something, and what was communicated, that they didn't hear it, they didn't understand, and so they've gone off on a, 
on a tangent and, and they're mis misinterpreting who Jesus is. And, and so John wrote the first letter of John, John 1. And, and that is, it, it's, it's somewhat meandering because he's, he's trying to figure out how to make this point that seems so crystal clear to him. But he's making this point that Jesus came water and spirit. God, Jesus came in the flesh. If you want to know who God is, God is love and love is, is Jesus. And, and he makes this, this point in the, in the first letter of John. And if you don't, if this doesn't make sense to you and you're not preaching this, then you are anti-Christ. You're preaching Jesus, but keep preaching him wrongly. And so now, in the second letter of John, we have damage control. This is a damage control letter. This is a letter that he has to write after writing the first letter that kind of like articulates his concern. And the second letter is what he sends out because... He's been telling people for years, when people knock on the door, you open it. If someone knocks on the door, it's one of two types of people. It's either someone who knows Jesus, in which case you welcome them in, and you are to help them along the way, because Jesus is told to those who follow him, travel light. Do not carry an extra cloak. Don't put a whole bunch of money in your, in your purse. Just travel light and trust that there will be people who will give you what you need. And, and so if someone knocks on the door, and, and it's a fo fellow follower of Jesus, you are to welcome them in, and give them a good meal, and give them what they need to keep on moving. And if someone knocks on the door and it's not a follower of Jesus, well, then you have good news for them. You can tell them, I'm welcoming you in, I am welcome you, welcoming you in because Jesus loves you. And I love you too because Jesus loves you. And let me put a meal on the table. Let's talk. Like, that is how he has taught the church correctly. I mean, that's, that's wonderful, right? And now we've come to this odd moment where he's having to tell them, if someone knocks on the door you might not be able to answer it. And this is weird. Like, this is the letter he never expected to have to write. If someone shows up and says that they're followers of Jesus and they want to come in and teach about Jesus, you have to check something. You have to check, are they preaching Jesus in the flesh? Because if they aren't, they could lead other people astray. And it's not that they want to lead other people astray. They have good intentions. But I'm, I've experienced it many times in my life. My good intentions are no guarantee that I'm going to get it right. And good intentions and getting it right don't always line up. And so if someone knocks on the door, you have to check. If they're going to preach, you got to make sure they're preaching Jesus in the flesh or else they could be leading people astray. So John is writing this letter that he never expected to write. And what he's doing, he is saying the same thing that Paul actually lands on. John is writing to the group of churches that are sort of the, the Johannine churches, the churches started by John and that community in one area of the world. And Paul, over in a different area of the world... He has to write to uh, the church at Corinth, at 2 Corinthians 11. He has to write to them, If someone comes to you preaching a Christ other than the one we preach to you, don't let them in. Right? So John and Paul are coming to the, the same conclusion in, very di in different places at different times. But they're coming to the, the same conclusion that, yes, open the door, but this is the one time, you, this is the one thing you got to check for. And so this letter, 2 John, John, is written to a lady. It's written to a lady who is not named. And, um, which is interesting, because 1 John is like a philosophical treatise. So there's not a lot of names in that. 3 John is written to Gaius, talking about a problem with diatrophies. 2 John has no names, and you'd expect it to if it was written to a specific person, and you know John is capable of doing this because he does it in, in 3 John. And so what we, as far as we can tell, what he is doing in 2 John is he is writing to the whole church, and he's addressing the church as a lady. Like, you know how, uh, if, you were, if you're, a, what, are the, what are the pronouns you use when talking about a ship? talk about she and her, right? That, that's the appropriate pronoun. So the, if you're going to talk about the whole church, John is using that. He's using a collective pronoun, talking to the lady, the church, talking about her in the same way that a captain would talk about his ship. And, and so that, that's kind of what we're thinking here, that he's addressing the whole ship and, and all the members of the church who are in it. And he's talking 
about this, and, and he's talking to the entire congregation, that telling them that something is coming, and, and I'm glad you've held on to the truth, but something is coming that is not true, and I need you to warn you about it. And at the end of the letter, he writes, there is so much other thing, there's so much other stuff I want to talk to you about, but the impression I get is, it is so important for this letter to get to you as soon as possible. I'm not going to take the time to write any further, so I can seal this up, hand it to the messenger, and get it out the door, because you need to know this as soon as possible. And, and so, and it's a sad letter, too, because at the beginning of the letter, he writes uh, to the lady, he says, some of your children have stayed in the truth. Uh, that's like saying to a mama, like, some of your children have turned out so well, with the implied, and some have not. Uh, you don't want to say it, but it's there, right? And so we have this letter, and to read this letter, like, you can read it, you have, we have to choose what the tone of voice is here. Because some people read this letter and read it as angry and as, as an odd disconnect. Like, we've gone from John talking about God is love, if you, if you have the love of God in yourself, you need to love your brother, love your family. And, uh, and then we get to this letter where he's saying, close the door. And I don't think this is a letter that's like a, a sharp break from what has come before, and also and John has lost his mind and turned into an angry man. What I think this is, is, is a letter written out of almost a panic, a sense of damage control, a sense of, I love this family so much, they need to know this right now so that they do not get into the, the problems that we're having over here. It, it's a, a letter of deep concern, a deep sadness about this situation that some people have sort of left the reservation and, and we need you just to take this one precaution so that you don't run into the same, same problem. And it is kind of hard for us to imagine having this level of argument amongst ourselves, because while Lord knows the church in America has a few arguments amongst itself, you can make a list, I'd agree, it's a long list. I'm not worried about someone like walking into the church right now and saying, may I preach? And us going, okay, fine, take the pulpit, and, and someone getting up here and starting to preach Jesus not as the Son of God, not as being fully human. Like, I, I don't worry about that. Like, the church in general today, we've kind of landed on Jesus, fully human, fully divine. Like, we, we aren't having that level of argument amongst ourselves. We're not, having, we're not having to shut the door so that antichrists don't come in and try to preach a different gospel, uh, which, I'm, which is good. Well, there is one more letter to read in this sort of situation. We've had 1 John, which laid out the problem. Help! We've had 2 John, which was make sure you shut the door so that you don't catch the problem. And then we have 3 John. And let's observe just the fact that we have 3 John means that 2 John worked. Right? Because if 2 John hadn't worked, there wouldn't be a 3 John. So 2 John worked, and the overall situation of the church is that they were able to hold on to Jesus fully human, fully divine. And this is good. And now we have 3 John, and 3 John is a course correction because, well, here's what's happened. 2 John told churches to shut your door if someone was coming in and preaching a false gospel. And there is one particular church we read of in 3 John, which is just as long as 2 John. I'd encourage you to go read it after worship. It will take you all of two minutes. And 3 John is written to a church led by Gaius. And the situation is, is that up the road, the next church up the road from Gaius is a church led by Diotrephes. And Diotrephes got the memo to shut the door, and then he never stopped shutting the door. And when the situation was all clear, and everyone was like, back to, okay, open the door, everyone in, they're either like going to preach and help you, or they're going to be guests, or they need to hear about Jesus, like, the storm has passed, everyone open the doors, let the sunshine in, everything's cool, Diotrephes up the road was said, nope, my door's shut, that's it, it worked for me then, I'm just keeping the door shut. And so, here is Gaius, and church people are coming down the road from Diotrephes, and they're coming up to Gaius' church and saying, saying, well, what's up with him? Like, 
he still has his door shut to anyone who shows up saying they come in the name of Jesus. Like, what's wrong with him? And, and this is a letter from John to Gaius saying, there's nothing that you like need to know. There's nothing like, Diotrephes doesn't have some secret knowledge. He's like, because you can see Gaius saying, if, if he didn't trust people coming by, should I? Right? John is re reassuring Gaius to say, it's okay. Just open the doors. Let people in. It's fine. I'll go deal with Diotrephes. And, and then he does say, Diatrophes is kind of a drama queen. He does kind of like to be the center of attention, but that's my problem. You just get back to welcoming people in. Right? And, and so that sort of wraps up the situation in, in, in the, the letters of John. And so this whole situation, it, it makes it clear that there are times when the very nature of the church is at stake. And there are times to say, no, we're not going to entertain that thought. No, we're not going to listen. No, that's not welcome here. And the point at which we get to that point is the point at which someone is questioning the very nature of who Jesus is. And other than that, everyone just needs to chill. And you can debate about it, you can argue about it, but at the end of the day, we come to this table together as people who follow Jesus, fully divine, fully human, yippee, right? That it's, and the fact that then we have third John, which is to say, like, yes, we had to have that moment, but we need to get back to how we were and keep on welcoming everyone in, no matter what, because now we're not arguing about the nature of Jesus. Third John is like the course correction to make sure everyone understands that while there are times that we get to that moment uh, of, of that level of, of argument, that's not the norm, that's not where we're supposed to be, and it is far more important to get back to having an open door and an open table at all times, because that's how we're supposed to live. Not in fear, but in gracious joy, welcoming people in. The comparison I would make is, the church welcomes everyone as often as a mother welcomes her children to come back home. Are there situations in which a mama does not welcome her children back home? There are some. How often does that happen, though? Not very, right? That's where we're at with this. The rest of the time, unless we're in a situation that is as rare as a mama cutting her children off, most of the time, this church is to remain open to all who knock. Because anyone who knocks is either someone who needs to hear about Jesus or someone who needs to hear how much this family loves them as fellow followers of Jesus. This church loves on people like a mama loves on her kids. Every day, all the time. Amen.